Uh, and to the agents who are brave enough to step forward and tell it like it is, we thank you. It takes a lot of bravery to step forward and, and do the right thing. And I, I know you probably had sleepless nights and, and, and we'll have some others uh, moving forward, but you're doing the right thing. And we want to thank you uh, for your service and for your bravery in, in sharing your, your personal perspective uh, in this situation. Um, Mr. Dodson, I, let's start with you for a second. What, at what point did you come to the, where you just, you had to come forward, you had to actually say something? Because usually these things kind of build up or something big happens. Explain to me what happened to where you thought enough is enough. Do, do you mean outside of ATF, sir, or? Or in this particular case, I mean, why did you get to this point where you're sharing this information? Well, but I questioned my supervisors almost immediately once we realized, you know, once we had relocated to Phoenix and uh, got briefed in and, and then actually started operationally that we were allowing all these guns to go. Um, then as, my, as the case agent, my supervisor, and ultimately my chain of command had all informed me that I was wrong and, and they were right and this was, you know, a righteous operation, it, it wasn't until um, December 15, 2010, um, when I read, what well, we have a SIR report, a significant incident report, detailing um, ATF's preliminary investigation into the trace and weapons purchased by Jaime Avila. And after reading that and then speaking with my FBI counterparts and learning that they were unaware of all of the events surrounding the purchase and trace of those firearms is when I had to go outside of ATF and I attempted to contact originally our uh, Chief Counsel's Office, our Ethics Section. Um, I made several attempts to contact the OIG's office and uh, ultimately I was able to speak to someone at Senator Grassley's office. Do you think that there is a conflict between the OIG, uh, given that maybe this started as a result of a recommendation, or do you see any sort of conflict that the Investigator General has in this case? Well, I, I can see a conflict between the office of the OIG, yes, sir, the actual individuals that are working the case. My interaction with them since I've been interviewed by them is that I, I think they get it. Um, however, those two offices, being what they are and how they are aligned, it's, there's inherently a conflict of interest there. If, in fact, someone at DOJ authorized this, is, knows about it, is as well versed in it as everyone at ATF, um, that thereby creates the conflict with OIG. Give me an idea of the size and scope. I mean, we're talking about thousands of guns knowingly going uh, south, so to speak. In your normal course of business, if you thought that there was a straw purchase happening, how many guns would kind of push you over the threshold to say, we better stop that? Well, sir, I can tell you this. Prior to my arriving in Phoenix in December 2009, my entire career we have never walked a firearm. And as a matter of fact, even if one had gotten away from us, if it was only a prop which had been mechanically engineered so that it could not effectively fire around, even if that got away from us, no one went home until we got it back. Even just one gun? Yes, sir. And in this case, we have thousands of guns. Now, what, what, was, what was the over, what was the, goal here? I mean, so I, I can tell you what I was told. I was told that the goal is to ultimately target and bring an entire cartel to prosecution. But how were they going to do that? I mean, the, car the suspected cartels were in Mexico, were they not? Yes, sir, they were. And I have no idea how they planned to do that by this operation or, or how it was designed to function. So what, was it the goal to knowingly and intentionally allow these guns to go into Mexico? As, uh, was that the ultimate goal? Not as explained to me. Was that part of, was that the rules in play to achieve what the goal that they had explained? Yes. We were mandated, let these guns go. Make no mistake, there was not a time we were out there on surveillance where we didn't have the forethought that these were going to be recovered in crimes. The next time we became aware of these guns would be when they were recovered at their final crime. Not whatever crime they might have done. It was the last crime that they commit, that they're, not they commit, but the person who has them commit, that they're recovered in. There may be nine or ten that the cartels have perpetrated with those firearms prior to that date, but that recovery date is when we'll learn about it. So ultimately what was the main goal, as explained to me, was to get a cartel. The mission, what we were doing, what we were ordered to do every day was watch these, the same guys, buy the same guns from the same dealers who we told to make the sales 
and then we'd sit back and wait for the traces. And when they came through from places in Mexico where it was definitively related to cartels, they were giddy. They thought that that justified, that, that, that created their nexus from this straw purchaser to the cartel. However, there's not a rookie police officer in this country that can explain to you how we're going to make a case on them with that information. My time has expired. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr.